Welcome back. Here's part two of our Sloan Digital Sky Survey Hubble Diagram Project. This is estimating distances to galaxies. There are a few methods that we use to actually estimate distances to galaxies. Um, the first one is using fluxes. And so this comes from the idea of magnitude. Now, the magnitudes that we gathered from the, the previous um, set, so I'm going to go back to here, we gathered magnitudes across a whole bunch of different filters. These are the same magnitudes as our magnitude scale that we used all year. Um, zero is uh, a rather bright star. Six would be the dimmest thing that we can see with our eyes. Um, 10, maybe a medium-sized backyard telescope can get you there. Actually, on a clear night, dark night, maybe binoculars can get you there. Um, but 18, 17, these are very, very dim magnitudes. You can't see these um, with small telescopes. Um, interestingly, the U has the dimmest of these magnitudes, and the G... R and I tend to have, actually the Z has another brighter one as well, um, but the U tends to be the dimmest. These will vary depending upon what kind of galaxy we're looking at it, how far away it is, um, a whole bunch of different factors. So for the next part of this project here, we're looking at how to calculate uh, with these numbers. So there is this value that we looked at before, this notion of flux. And flux, uh, if you remember, is this quantity that tells us how much light we are receiving from a particular object. So if we have a distant galaxy, that might be, and there's my technical drawing for galaxy, and we are some distance away from it, and that distance we are away from it, d, is what defines a gigantic sphere. So some distance d. Let's say this galaxy gives off a whole bunch of light. We'll call it L. We can call it capital L for all the, the light that this galaxy gives off. At the point where we are observing, we are observing a very small cross-section of this very gigantic sphere. Uh, so what we receive over here is called the flux. Um, and so you can just make a spherical argument here that the flux is equal to the total light that's given off by this galaxy divided by the surface area of this sphere, which is 4 pi d squared. So the amount of flux that we're actually receiving is, is basically like a number of photons. Um, we have a, a formula for taking a magnitude and turning it into a flux number. It's not um, any standard unit set that we typically work with but we just need a number to make comparisons to other galaxies. So that formula, I'm going to write it out here, 2.51 to the minus m, that is essentially saying oh, 1 over 2.51 to the m power. And basically I take a magnitude, I raise um, 2.51 to that magnitude's power, and... Um, invert the whole thing, and that gives me the so-called radiant flux. And again, this is scale, just depends on what filter you're using. So say you're using the, the red uh, magnitude, we're kind of looking at how many, the flux would be, how many red photons are we receiving from a particular galaxy? That's a way to think about this. Um, and so with this flux number, what we can do is we can use this to, to linearize our distances, our distance estimates to galaxies, because magnitude is not linear. It's a logarithmic scale based on our eyes. In practice, what this looks like in a spreadsheet is I have a bunch of raw data here. So this is what comes from, let me go back to our project page. At the very end of this page, I'm given a bunch of galaxies that come from this picture. I'm going to work backwards through this page, actually. Um, so this picture is, in principle, three different galaxy clusters. Um, I see clumpings of galaxies, um, and I see some galaxies that appear slightly bigger and maybe more orange, and some that appear a little tiny, a little dimmer and more red. And so 
These are clusters that are kind of overlapped on top of each other um, in terms of our field of view. So exercise 12 was to open a navigation window. And once it opens up, it's showing that same region of sky. And then we can show objects with spectra. And we can only look at, we can only use as data points, objects that have spectra, because if there's no spectra, we can't get a redshift. So all the spectra objects are um, indicated with a red square. And then we're told, well, here's a galaxy, there's the magnitudes, and then there's a spectrum right there, and we can do some quick looks at it. Um, this is also a galaxy. Um, this is a galaxy. And we're going to find some stuff here that is actually not a galaxy. Um, I believe this thing here, uh, that's a galaxy. One of them I know is not. Um, there's a star right here. It says star. The spectrum looks kind of weird. Um, if I go to explore, and again, go to explore. Uh, I'll show you quick look as well. Quick look doesn't give you the same level of information. So both are opening right now. Here's quick look. It's kind of the same as what we saw there. It gives you redshift through a whole bunch of uh, decimals, but it doesn't give you that much else. Um, what we Another the number that I want you to get here is also the petroradius. And so I may as well get it now before we start um, looking at uh, how to put this together. But this we can't use because this is a star. It's not a galaxy. Um, so I'm going to close those up. Uh, this is also a star. Um, this is one I did want to show you here because, yeah, this this star, actually, where was it? This star right here. Sorry, I'm clicking around looking for the wrong thing. There it is. This one is very flat. Um, and the spectrum looks like a galaxy, but the database is labeling this as a star. That's a red flag to me. I can't use this as a data point. This one right here is clearly a star. Um, it's a distant dim star maybe, or maybe a distant bright star just far away. But if I look at the spectrum, what's happening here, this is super black body. Uh, there's a big peak and a long tail, and then we have all these dips of absorption lines. Galaxies, we usually expect things like emission lines. So this is not something we could use for a Hubble diagram but I just wanted to show you that the black body pops up here because this is a single black body uh, rather than a collection of black bodies. That's what a galaxy would be. Um, so you'll go through, you'll get your information here, and the raw data um, that I pull out of that one is actually over here. So these are all the things I picked that were galaxies. I got the R magnitudes, I got the petroradii, and I got the I magnitudes. And so what we do with these, we'll go back to our project page, is we'll do some calculations with the numbers. And more specifically, we're going to let Excel do some calculations with the numbers. So this notion of relative distance. So we need these, these exercises, or actually we can kill multiple birds with one rock here. Um, and I will show you a spreadsheet that does this all together. And again, you have the template um, of the spreadsheet. The link is in the, the video description. So I have some raw information from galaxies from the, the previous set. This was from exercises one through four. Um, I have redshift, um, I have the R magnitude, and I have the petro radius uh, right here. I recorded, I went back and I recorded that. Um, the brightness distance, what I do here, I'm going to show you is I have a calculation in the formula bar 2.51 to the minus B3. So that's turning this magnitude, this red magnitude, into a red flux. Um, the flux distance is where we are going to take one over this and then um, raise it to a certain power. And I'm going to show you how this actually is working out right here. So I have my flux um, as 2.51 to the uh, 
minus m. Oh, I gotta open this up slightly to show what's going on here. My spreadsheet got a little truncated. That can happen. Again, you can always go in between your columns and spread them out. So flux is 2.51 to the minus magnitude power. Um, distance in terms of what flux is is going to be 1 over the square root of your flux. And that's because here, 1 over distance squared is flux as well. So I can turn flux into distance by doing the inverse of that equation. So this equation is what I'm doing right here. Um, so that'll be this cell, D3, is raised to the minus 0.5 power because 1 over square root is the minus 0.5 power. So I get this flux distance. And then once I get a formula in a cell, I can copy it and paste it all the way down. Um, and the last bit is finding the relative distance. So what I'm saying is I'm going to say this is the closest galaxy, and I'm going to scale all of these galaxies to this one. And so my formula looks like this. E3 divided by, I use dollar signs to anchor both the column and the row. If I didn't do that, I'll show you what will happen. I'll clear all of this out. If I just said this is E3 over E3, when I pasted this down, what happens is it's all just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. But then I'll go back. If I write in a different formula, if I go this equals E3 over E dollar sign 3, then what happens is I can copy this and paste it all the way down. And then the next entry here you can see is E4 divided by still E3. So the dollar sign is anchoring uh, the top reference. Um, but I'm going to undo all of that and go back to what I had there before. So this is what we call, again, the relative flux distance or brightness distance. Basically, a distance estimate measured from the, the magnitudes or the photometric measurement of the galaxy. There is another type of distance estimate that we could make, and that is based on size. Um, I'll go back to the project description right now. Um, write the two techniques uh, for finding relative distance as algebraic equations derived from using geometric or physical principles. So the flux distance method, that is all right here, algebraic principles. There is a, another method for estimating a distance to a galaxy. And I just want to open up a little OneNote page here again. So let me zoom out and let's call this, if I have a observation telescope right here and I'm looking at a galaxy here and I'm looking at a galaxy that is further away, thinking of my field of view, this galaxy will look bigger than this galaxy. And so it scales um, linearly with the distance. If something is twice as far away, it's going to look half as big. So it's as simple as that. So the other uh, method here, we could say distance equals 1 over the radius. And where did I get that radius? That came from that petroradius. And so the petroradius, I'll go back to one of the um, galaxy uh, data points here. Let's go back here, and let's say I looked at a particular galaxy in the navigation tool. And let's look at one of these ones again. Uh, again, object with spectra, though this is just for looking at the radius purpose. And I click on a galaxy, um, and then I go to explore. You can only find this exp in explore. You can't get this in quick look. Um, this number here is in arc seconds. So it literally is how much does this galaxy span across the sky? Notice how it says 4.29. This distance here is five arc seconds. So what we're really looking at is what is the longest radius that this galaxy smudge will take up in this picture. This matters for some of the spirals that we see super edge on. We'll go with the longer radius of that spiral rather than the shorter radius. So we call this the petroradius.
Um, I'll go back to our project page here. And so looking at this again, this is um, uh, the second algebraic technique. So just one over um, D and then the same thing, uh, the relative distance. So I got my sizes here, one over this radius, that's C3. And then I did the same thing. I scaled all of these to that particular um, first galaxy. Um, it doesn't matter which one you scale them towards. Um, later on, we'll see uh, why we choose a galaxy to scale it towards. But in this case, it doesn't matter. It's just learning how to manipulate the spreadsheet. Um, going on to exercises 12 and 13 now, um, I did the same thing here so across a bunch of different methods. So going back to the project um, description, um, suppose question two is suppose the relative distance for a number of galaxies using brightnesses don't agree with the relative distances using apparent size. Well, um, the assumptions aren't always um, accurate. Sometimes galaxies are bigger and smaller. Sometimes they are dimmer and brighter, even if they're the same distance. And so we have to look at some other clues. And so why can we assert galaxy clusters are all at the same distance? Or, or one of our ways around this is we use a galaxy cluster. Um, I'll draw a very simple diagram, but we did this in class um, a few classes ago. So again, if I move up this little Excel or this OneNote sheet, and let's say we look at a galaxy cluster, make these look like galaxies. Uh, they're all just scribbles, but we're conceptually thinking of them as galaxies. So a cluster is kind of like a big ball of galaxies. And if I am looking at, and this is my little crappy telescope, um, if I am looking at galaxies, um, I'm going to assume that they're all some distance away, some capital D. But the cluster itself has some size in the sky we'll call delta D. And so however big this cluster spreads in the sky, um, we can interpret that if it's spherical, it's also going to be the uncertainty in the distance this way. So the uncertainty in the distance, delta D over D. So we can say that this is D plus or minus um, delta D over D approximately. So that's exercise nine, show that the fractional error in the assumption that galaxies in a spherical cluster are all at the same distance is equal to the cluster's angular size. This is the cluster's angular size. Um, question four, what are some of those clues and cues um, for figuring out if one galaxy is further? Well, you got a lot of galaxy clusters to look at. I'll open a couple of these, and I'll just point out some of the, the tricks and techniques. These galaxies that all kind of appear the same size and brightness are definitely closer than, say, galaxies in this cluster that I can't use any other word back here. It's further away. So galaxies in a cluster will look all similarly sized, um, maybe similarly colored because all their lights redshifted approximately the same amount. Um, let's look at another one of these clusters here. Yeah, this one's a little hard because you got uh, some big blue thing here, but that's uh, clearly a star. That's a galaxy. That's a galaxy. I would expect that the galaxies in the cluster are all going to share um, approximately the same redshift. That's another thing because every galaxy in a cluster is going to be gravitationally bound to the cluster. And so it's really the whole cluster we see that's moving away from our own galaxy. So redshift is another indicator that we look for. So we look at all similar redshifts for galaxies in a particular cluster. Um, question five, really, I want you to think about all of these different points here. These are all things that we have to consider. And so if you're going to use the brightness distance method versus the, the apparent size distance method, um, you really have to, to know your data and know the nuances of it. And one thing that Hubble did um, with his assistant, uh, Milton Humison, he would take actually the fifth rank galaxy in a cluster, so the fifth brightest one. So assuming he wasn't taking the biggest one, but he wasn't taking the smallest one. So those are that was one way he did it. So now we're back here to this uh, set of um, data that we had to gather. I'll go back to that tab. 
And if you notice that if I use, and these are all in order, so this is, say, this object here, this is its R magnitude, this is its petro radius, this is its I magnitude, these relative distances don't necessarily match up with these relative distances or, or these ones. Um, they The trends will be there, but they don't exactly match up. And so that is uh, really, we have three different methods of determining distances to this set of six galaxies. Um, relative flux distance using the R magnitude, um, relative distance using apparent size, and relative flux distance using an I magnitude. And so different filters uh, would, would be a different distance method as well. So let's go back again to our project page last time. Um, the this whole section is really just getting into the nuances and the trickiness of trying to convert either an apparent size number or an apparent magnitude number into a distance number for a galaxy and it's really tricky so we want to be ready with multiple options and understand what they're telling us so that's the end of this one um, the next one will be on redshifts